So I'd love for you to set the stage here. What's happening in outer space since the war on Ukraine started? We're seeing some big shifts in the sort of center of gravity, if you will, for space technologies. Yeah, you touched on two of the big headlines. Uh, there's the lack of launch uh, from Soyuz for Western players, uh, famously in the last couple of weeks. OneWeb, a UK-based company, has been forced to buy launches from a competitor in SpaceX uh, that has their own internet constellation. So that's one big piece of the story. And the second is the uh, embargo on Russian rocket engine in which Russia announced that they will no longer be selling here to the U.S. So I think the most common question I get on that piece of news is uh, the U.S. was buying Russian rocket engines. I, I think that one always surprises folks. Yeah, it is a bit of a surprise, isn't it, given the, the political tensions. And, you know, I think folks forget that before SpaceX, there wasn't a lot of option out there, right, Joe? So this must be pretty good news for you and your company. Right. Is your phone ringing quite a lot to ask about the readiness of your rocket engines? It is. Yeah, yeah the, obviously the international piece of this has been extremely busy. Uh, the U.S. government has been extremely busy. And then the commercial side is extremely impacted here as well. Uh, SpaceX obviously is doing a tremendous job uh, filling, filling their manifest with satellite operators, but the entire world has gone from a position of is the launch market oversaturated to uh, why is OneWeb buying launches from a competitor? So uh, I, I think that we're going to continue to stay really busy. And luckily, it's just shining a light on the propulsion industrial base globally and how, how companies like Ursa Major can come to help out both commercial entrants and uh, the U.S. government. So talk to us about that. How is Ursa Major different from SpaceX or Blue Origin or what the Russians have to offer? Well, we're different from the Russians in that we're entirely domestic. So we can provide uh, rocket engines here to the U.S. government and to U.S. players and Western players uh, as it suits them. But uh, as far as our business model and how we differentiate ourselves from a SpaceX or a Blue Origin, we are entirely propulsion focused. So our engines are designed to meet a, a wide range of needs from space launch uh, on orbit to hypersonic testing in the case of some of our customers. So. There's a technological advantage there in which the engines are designed for a wide range of applications and uh, pretty diverse capability. But there's also a, an economic side of it in which we have a production line that we just got rolling this year. So uh, there are some economies of scale for, for us delivering the same type of engine to multiple customers or multiple applications. Hey, Joe, let's talk about that production line. I actually was listening to Elon Musk in Texas recently yeah. talk about how SpaceX is building one Raptor engine a day almost. But of course, SpaceX doesn't sell their Raptor engines to anyone else. What kind of pace of production have you guys got? And, and how quickly and how do you build these things? 3D printing, right? Yeah, one a day is a tremendous pace. So we just started production in January of this year. And we hope to be delivering 30 engines to customers by the end of this year. But uh, the focus is really shifting us from a capacity perspective of how many engines per year to a rate, uh, much like Elon said, an engine a day. We'd like to be at two engines a week uh, here in the not too distant future. So uh, the ramping there is really limited by uh, how quickly we can assemble the engines. You touched on the 3D printing piece. Almost every part of these engines that is a primary component or a metallic component is 3D printed. Uh, we then hand assemble them here in Colorado and test them about 100 yards from where they are assembled. So I'm sitting not too far from where we fire our rocket engines. Joe, there's another part of this story, and that is hypersonic weapons. The U.S. has confirmed that Russia has used hypersonic weapons against Ukraine, but the U.S. is behind not just Russia, but also China in hypersonic weapons. And the government is calling on companies like you to help change this. Talk to us about why this is important. Yeah, that's that's the other side of the coin of the story here. Uh, we just saw uh, we just saw Russia claim that they'd used the first hypersonic weapon in, in warfare. So the U.S. has been developing hypersonic capabilities for many years now. But what we've seen over the last couple of years is a resurgence of focus on flight testing hypersonics. So our engines are unique in that they are capable of being used on a number of applications, number of different vehicles, and they're capable of things like deep throttle or multiple restarts. So. We can simulate flight across a pretty wide range of hyper missions, and that's really important for this next phase of development because the U.S. will be forced right. to develop not just new hypersonic vehicles, but new technology and new capabilities, and that flight testing is an enormous component.
Hey, Joe, we only got a few seconds. How much money are you guys going to make this year? <laughs> it's hard to say yet. The year is definitely early, but we were excited to see a, a pretty heavy focus from the DOD budget that was just recently approved on hypersonic testing and spaceflight. So um, some, some nice tailwinds for us.